Very few poets, and Norman Corwin was a poet, very few poets express themselves in such a boldly American way as did Norman Corwin. In his more than 100 years, his contributions to broadcasting are immeasurable. He was award-winning. He boosted the American spirit. But you have to remember one thing. Norman Corwin loved the language and loved words. And he used words on radio in ways few had used them before. We could spend an evening playing his best works from The Plot to Overthrow Christmas to 13 by Corwin to all of the other things that Corwin did. But during these few minutes, I want to go back to the wonderful broadcast that may have been the most listened to radio show of all time. On a note of triumph, the all-star live broadcast at the end of the European phase of World War II. At one point in the broadcast, the narration, read by Martin Gable, talks about the costs of war. These costs are calculable and have no nerve endings and will eventually be taken care of by the federal taxes on antique cigarettes and excess profits. However, in the matter of the kid who used to deliver folded newspapers to your doorstep, flipping them sideways from his bicycle, and who died on a jeep in the Ruhr... There is no fixed price, and no amount of taxes can restore him to his mother. We're gonna tell the postman next time he comes around that Mr. Hitler's new address is the Berlin burying ground. Round and around Hitler's grave, round and around we go. Gonna lay that feller down, he won't get up no more. The broadcast, an hour long, was a flawless piece of American radio, and as I say, the most listened to broadcast of its kind in the history of the medium. And it ended with a prayer that you still hear quoted now and then. Post proofs that brotherhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. Sit at the treaty table and convoy the hopes of little peoples through expected straits and press into the final seal a sign that peace will come for longer than posterities can see ahead that man unto his fellow man shall be a friend forever It is interesting to note that Corwin got advance word from the White House that VE, Victory in Europe Day, was just ahead. He was on a transcontinental train trip at the time. So he started writing a script and arranged for actors to stand by in both New York and in Los Angeles. It turned out that with original music by Bernard Herrmann, the show was broadcast out of Los Angeles. And another show that had been done just as World War II opened was called We Hold These Truths. It was the story of the Bill of Rights broadcast just a week after Pearl Harbor, and it contains one of the greatest speeches ever written for a then very young Orson Welles. Instructed by the people of the 13 states, threw up a bulwark, broke a hope, and made a sign for their posterity against the bigots, the fanatics, bullies, lynchers, race haters, the cruel men, the spiteful men, the sneaking men, the pessimists, the men who give up fights that have been just begun. The Congress wrote a ten-part epic. I feel very fortunate that I crossed paths with Norman Corwin several times. The first time, back in 1968, when he guest taught one summer at Indiana University. And then about 12 or 13 years ago, I sat down with him to do a full one-hour interview. And in one part, I mentioned to him that I was stumbling for the right word to use in asking a question, and that I myself had a great love of language. The poverty of language distresses me, and I'm very happy to hear you allude to it, because it's one of the, one of the striking uh, 
lacks in the educational process today. For example, Dennis, if I may, uh, I have long felt that that education on a secondary school level, and even on higher, higher than that, misses a great bet when they do not enlist etymology in the curriculum. Because when a youngster learns that a word has that the, the word cereal is named after a, after a goddess of agriculture, Ceres, and one uh, th- learns that denim, the denim is is named after a, f- a French town, and they learn that that um, that manufacture is from two Latin words meaning to make by hand. Exactly, exactly, and calculate has to do with calcium because they 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 calculated uh, with beads of calcium. That was the that was the uh, original uh, unit, and all of these. Then they get a sense of the richness and the poetry. Let me detain you with one small example: the word of the flower daisy. Now. The, to the mintus of the, our language, and somebody had to invent words. It, the world was not created with with vac- vocabularies, <clears throat> and uh, uh, this flower had had a golden center, and it had white petals radiating from that center. And some poet came along and said, "How like the day's eye, meaning the sun." And so it was daisy. The flower was called daisy, and then it became daisy. Now, what a charming etymology that is, and how it would give uh, n- not only knowledge and enrichment to the student, but a sense of proprietorship in his language. Yes, I know that. Yes, that's a warm thought. What a pretty word! And it came from here, and it went there. And <laughs> uh, and I, uh, you know, so much can be done and isn't being done. But you debate sometimes. I wrote the word ostensibly in a newscast one day, and I stopped and thought, well, maybe someone won't know what ostensibly means, and then I kicked myself for saying, why worry about that? I know what it means. It's still in the dictionary. Why should I have to write down to people? That's right. I I think it's uh, self a self-regulating process in the lowering of the vocabulary is very destructive. And I think we're suffering the effects of it. Last thing I was going to ask, 50 years ago, you're, you're working yourself silly at CBS. You're meeting these week-to-week deadlines. You're taking a thought out of your mind, letting it loose, getting the music for it, hiring the actors, putting the show on, and then hoping it comes off on time. Did you think 50 years later some of the world would still have a fascination for that? Or was there any look toward the future? Was it a job? Was it just... I I guess I'm not asking the question well. I'm just trying to figure out what was in your head at the time. It's a good question. Uh, There was never a thought of projecting beyond the end of the week, beyond the program itself. Uh, I never thought the work was that singular, uh, that durable, and... I wrote it, for example, I was asked by CBS to have a, an hour program ready for the night of victory in Europe. Well, I, I was doing a series. They said, please stop in the middle of it, prepare, because it may be soon. So I did, and I stopped, and I worked hard on it. And when it was broadcast I, and it was finished, I thought, well, you know, I wiped the sweat from my brow, and I thought, well, we got through that one. I didn't just, it didn't uh, fall on my face, and uh, people seemed to like it. And I never dreamed that that would be around 50 years later. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I am I'm cannot uh, deny that I'm, I'm pleased, but also a little surprised that it is. And that radio, such a transient medium, uh, can do this. Uh, gives me added pleasure that that most words, most programs are writ in air and they, they, they vanish, like skywriting. And Norman Corwin's words were in a way written on the sky, on the ether of broadcast waves. He will be remembered as the great American radio writer, producer, director, but I prefer to remember him as one of America's greatest poets. I'm Dennis Daly.